After serving 24 years in Walpole, and I believe uh, the total became 17 years in segregation for 24, that's in Walpole. Um, I ended up getting out. My father died. Um, I didn't mention about my mom early in Walpole. She, she died from bad causes. Um, that's what led me to my, that conviction. But anyways, they hurt my mother. Um, but my father died the same day I got out from Walpole. I remember that day because it was crucial. And you know what's crazy? That um, the captain came and told me that my time was up in Walpole. And um, I told him I wasn't going anywhere. And I was in the STG block and the gang block. And I won't mention the gangs. There was two different gangs in there. And um, he asked me, he says, uh, Sanchez, your time is up. You got to pack your shit and go. I'm sorry for using the word shit. Uh, you got to pack your things and go. Because that's the way they talk. I said, well, why? He said, because your time is up. I said, so? He says, you got to go. I said, I ain't going. He said, well, if you don't go, what we're going to do, we're going to use the extraction team and get you out of here. We'll throw you, your stuff right out the front door and throw you out the front door. I said, well, make it happen then, because I'm not going anywhere. And he pulled me to the side, he said, Sanchez, you're, you're done with your time. I says, I ain't got nothing to do out there. I don't know the way of life, you know? It's nothing, I have nothing out there. My father is dying, my mother's dead. I don't have nobody to go to. This is all I know. I did 24 years in your system. And he felt so bad that I can see a shed a tear coming out. He said, Sanchez, please don't make me order for them to remove you. I said, well, go ahead and do it. So when I went, when, while in the block, um, I had the gang leaders come to me. And they even cried too. They said, listen, OG, you've been here long enough. It's time for you to go home. I said, but I don't know anything out there. What? I don't want nothing out there. This is all I know. See, this is what I'm saying. You become a product of the system. You become so institutionalized that um, that's the way of life for you. And so um, I remember that day, and it really troubles me because um, who in the hell wants to be in prison? You know? And. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it, it really did hurt me, and it, it, but it hurts me now because I have to think of that part, and I'm saying, well, even now I'm saying, why would I want to be in there? But at that time, the mind, the chain of mind, the way I had it. Well, anyways, to make it short, um, the, the gang members ended up talking to me and talked me out of it, and I did. I packed my stuff and left. Well, my sister pulled up in the parking lot. Uh, she said, listen, um, Dad's in the coma. He's dying from cancer. We need to go to the hospital now. So I went straight to the hospital, and uh, I walked in. I kissed my father, and in this year, I told him, Dad, I love you. Danny Jr. is here. I'm senior now. I took his title, and uh, he stopped breathing. And And he stopped breathing. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, he stopped breathing. It really affects me till today. He died right there. He was waiting for me. That's what they say. He was waiting for me. He was waiting for his older boy to come home. Um, from there, my daughter uh, convinced me to come to Georgia. I mean, I'm sorry, Virginia. I don't know why I said Georgia. I came down to uh, Virginia. I moved to Virginia. Uh, I'm coming to find out. She has some issues. Um, so I said, well, what's going on? And she said, well, I, I invite one guy in and he brought in a bunch of gang members and I can't get him out. I said, really? I said, who are the gang members? She explained to me who they were, so I'm not gonna, <clears throat> of course, once again, I can't put them out like that. Um, so I ended up going down cleaning house. I had a clean house and I got rid of all of them. Once we did that, then uh, I met her husband. He, he was in naval office, um, in naval, 
in the Navy, and uh, I found out he was abusing her and my grandson. I punished him too for putting his hands on both of them. I punished him. And so um, because of that, of course, he whined and dined her, gave her flowers, I'm sorry. And I, so she ended up kicking me out. Anyways, I, I run into a lady and I had a relationship with her and she had my baby and she worked at a particular restaurant, which I can't mention uh, for the reason for just in case I get a job with them in the future. I hope they forget. It's so old. Um, he put his hands on her and uh, hurt her while she was pregnant with my daughter. Now, um, that did bother me, it did. I just got out only 11 months. It bothered me, I was not adjusted yet to society. And of course, the way of life of Walpole, um, I went and punished him. So I received a sentence of 16 years. I went to the feds. Um, the, the state, of course, dropped it. They didn't want nothing to do because they figured the feds would give me more time. And they did, it's true. Their, their, uh, their status, um, their strategic, I'm sorry. It worked because that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to get the most time they came for me. They wanted me off the street. And they did um, because my sentence carried for 15 years to life. But I served 16 years in, um, for protecting my family. And I went to the feds. Um, now the feds, one thing about the feds, um, <laughs> I started at Petersburg, FCI Petersburg, right here in Virginia. Uh, and I ended up in California. I ended up in Florida. I ended up in uh, uh, Oklahoma, um, the state of Washington, Pennsylvania. They ship you all around. It's not like the state where they locate you and keep you within the state. You can end up in the moon with the feds. If they have a base up, in the moon, they'll send you to the moon. If they have the, cap they do got the capability, by the way. I believe so. Uh, so I served 16 years. In those 16 years, it was, I've been to institutions like Walpole. Um, they took me to California, <laughs> and I hate California. In California, um, the Mexicans and the blacks are at war. Um, and I won't mention their name, but the Mexicans runs with the whites, and I won't mention their names. It's a group. And of course, they got the regular Mexicans, the farm boys that come from Mexico. They run that. I was the only Puerto Rican in that, yeah, but why I went there is another story. Um, I was at Petersburg, and a cop called me a spick, called me a racial name. And unfortunately, um, I reacted. I had to take care of business. And so what I did was uh, I did that, and I ended up getting shipped to California. So when they sent me to California, is they sent me to my death, because I was the only Puerto Rican in that yard. So when I arrived there that night, they already knew. You know what's funny about the feds is they know when you're coming. They know exactly. They got your paperwork. They know who you are. So when I got there, The Mexicans came to me and tried to give me the rules. This is how it is. You're running out of our, our people. And this is what we want you to do. Unfortunately, because of way of life in prison, I had to react to that. And I put him in check immediately. And then the other Mexicans, because another group, which I can't mention, I had to put them in check. One of those guys did time with me in Walpole State Prison. And he's a Puerto Rican, but he runs with the Mexicans because he moved out there. But because he was the number second one in power, he came to me and he went to the first Mexican. He told him to rest with his people. He says, you put your hands on this man. We got his back. He saved my life in Walpole. I did, I saved his life twice. And they were, they were gonna murder him. They were gonna kill him. And I remember that, but I didn't recognize him because he had tattoos on his head. He was told he looked like a Mexican. 
Well, anyway, he made my life a little bit more comfortable at California. And then the other side was the, the blacks. And I'm not going to mention their groups. We, we all know what time it is. But I chose to be with them, the blacks, than the Mexican because the Mexicans don't like Puerto Ricans, and that's what I am, Puerto Rican. We have discrimination within our own race. It's wrong, but that's just the way it is. The way of life in, in California, that was a maximum. And I'll tell you the name of the place, though. It's called Victorville. It's in Bernardino County in California. It's one of the, one of the most roughest places in federal system at the time. It was the probably number one killing joint besides Pollock, Big Sandy's, and there's a couple of more that I can think of, Allenwood. Okay, those are the four major ones in, in the feds where killing is the way of life. So we're going back to the same issue about I'm a product of the system. You know, even when you want to change, they don't let you change. Even when they, you ask them for a break, the case manager, give me a break. Don't send me the Supermax, please. They do not care. They send you to where you're designed to send because there's a purpose behind the administration that you don't know. Mine is, yes, I have a background. We'll talk about that. We're not talking about criminal. We're talking about I have a background within the system also. Because of that reputation and because of being defiant to them and standing up for yourself, this is the situation you go through. They put you in a situation where they put your life in danger. Why I was placed on diesel therapy. First, let me explain what diesel therapy is. Diesel therapy is a method that the feds use when they don't like somebody, or they have assault on staff, or they have some type of record reflects in opposition to them. They also do it to jailhouse lawyers who help people. Whatever it is that they don't like, they put you on diesel therapy. The reason why they put me on diesel therapy um, was the fact that um, an officer called me a spick, a racial comment, and I ended up breaking his jaw. Um, I didn't really want to. Actually, I even questioned him as to why, you know, you're using racist. And he turned around, he put his hands on me. The second time he put his hands on me, he grabbed me by the shirt. That's when I reacted. I broke his jaw. So they placed me. In fact, I was in FCI Petersburg right here in Virginia. And they sent me across the country for a whole year. I visited probably 25 states out of 50. And it was the most, um, there was times that I found myself crying. I felt disgusted from smelling. I wasn't able to groom, cut my nails. Um, my hair was probably behind, it was long, it was curly, it was behind my back. I had a beard that went down past my stomach. It's a way of, they use to punish you. It's not right, but that's how they do it. That's what a lot of my transfer was with the feds. And even if you have one incident with an officer, it carries out through you through your entire bid in the feds. So you can 30 years not have an issue and they still will bring that up and still use it against you to punish you. The difference between Walpole and the feds is that Walpole was, I can't say it's more, yeah, Walpole was more extremely violent, but they do have federal institutions that are extremely violent as well but nothing like Walpole. But if I had chose which one, I'd rather be a Walpole. Because the 24 years I got adapted and I had a status within the system. They knew who I was, people knew who I was. So not many people would come mess with me, not many. But I've had some incidents, I've had some incidents. I've had some incidents with jealousy. Um, people felt threatened with my presence. Um, particularly gang members. They would set um, orders out to me, um, contracts against me to eliminate me in the yard. Uh, there was a time um, 
In fact, it was Victorville. And I uh, went to the bathroom, a facility, and two guys walk in there. And uh, one of them had a knife and the other one didn't. And so the one with the knife didn't come at me, but the other did, guy did. And uh, he turned around and told me that um, I'm going to pay him rent because I'm Puerto Rican. They run that yard. So I ended up hitting him, knocking him out. And the guy that pulled out the knife, he just held it. And I turned around and just pretty much broke his arm and took the knife. And nothing was never said. So nobody knew nothing. It was an isolated incident. They call it isolated incident. But Walpole is different. Um, yeah. I've had six guys come out in the yard while I was playing basketball, and they jumped me. And uh, by the time that, um, because it was a caught on camera, by the time he went to stab me, he had like um, a 10 inch knife. It's called bone, cu uh, bone crusher. Yeah, if he would have hit me with that, I would have been dead. Um, by the time that uh, they did all that, and he pulled out his knife, the police was out there, and they sprayed him with mace. Um, I didn't ask the police for protection, um, but they did it on camera, so they pretty much told on themselves. I mean, because if I'm going to get somebody, I'm going to get them in the cell. I'm not going to get them in front of the police. So pretty much when they do it in front of the police, it's because they're afraid of you. They're afraid of you. But like I said, that's the way of life in there. And if you don't know how to fight, and if that's the way of your life, you better make it because that's the only way. Unfortunately, these days, um, no, but there are some joints like that now that are like that, that are very active on extreme violence, and it's the way of life. Uh, but back in the days in the 70s and in early 80s, it was in 60s, it was a common, it was the way of life all over the country. And, I, and I'm not trying to glorify Walpole, but it has this respect. Uh, yeah, I went to Victorville. I arrived to Victorville, and um, yeah, a riot jumped off between the blacks and the Mexicans, and it lasted two days. Um, there was blood all over the yard. Now, the fences have barbed wire fences, so you can't jump over the next fence to the next yard, and so. You, it was so violent that people fear that they, listen, they even remove arms. There was arms missing from the body off those fences. That's how fear, they'd rather lose an arm on the barbed wire razors than get stabbed to death in the yard. It lasted two days. I was in the middle of it. Knives came out. It was war and I had a fight. I had a fight for my life. I did. Um, I sided with the blacks because I, Mexicans and Puerto Ricans, we don't like each other. Yeah, that lasted for two days. The state police came in, the U.S. Marshals, they came in with firearms. They came in with weapons, automatic weapons. They were dropping, they were even killing people. Yeah, I mean, it was a war. Helicopters, everything came. I mean, it was serious. It was a serious situation. Well, my last year was in Cumberland, FCI Cumberland Feds. I suffered a lot because the type of criteria people there, they were a whole different thing. We had new generation. There was a lot of disrespect, staff disrespect. So, you know what's crazy is that they can talk to one of these young, new guys, young blood coming in, we call them young bloods, and they tell them to shut the F up, and they shut up. But you tell them to shut the F up, and they want to stab you, and they want to jump you with about 20 guys. So I would say, well, listen, why you disrespect this man? The police just disrespect you. Why you don't ride on him? Why are you riding on your own? Is this how they program you? You know, so it, you had a different clientele in prison. So it made my time harder because I don't come from that environment. I come from a different environment. So they put me in an environment in a lesser security system. I wanted to go to high security because I've been in high security all my life. I'm accustomed to being locked down. 
I'm accustomed to coming out of my cell with cuffs and shackles on and being escorted with four or five goon squad. That's the way I did my time. This is what I'm accustomed to. And uh, I went to the Union Mission. That was the first place I went to, the shelter home. And from the shelter home, I went there. But then I didn't know that my ex, my baby mama worked next door. So they came to me and said, listen, you got to leave the property. I said, what's going on? I haven't done that. She said, no, you've done well here. You've done all the programs. But the problem is, we didn't know that you have a, you had a relationship with one of our staff and she has your child. So you can't stay here. You come back on the property, we're going to have you arrested. So that killed that opportunity in that shelter. So they, I left without no problem. I went to Salvation Army and they treat me bad too. So they only gave me maybe uh, seven days and told me I can't come back no more for no reason at all. So that left me homeless. So those are the only two places of shelter home in, in Virginia, in Norfolk. So now I'm on the street because of that. So I don't understand why. That's what they're designed for to help homelessness and I, don't, I can't get no help.